Please note that filming text on the whiteboard requires extremely bright studio lighting. Subsequently, sunglasses were worn during the filming of this video to prevent damage to my retinas. A note on how to use these sessions. Jot down the notes as we go, so we'll help you learn the material in a more interactive way, and you can use them as study notes later. Also, in the small chance that a discrepancy arises between the professor's notes and mine, always go with your professor. They're the one grading you. Lastly, any examples or analogies used in the session are not meant to support or criticize politics, religion, or lifestyle. They're merely learning tools to help understand the material. All right, guys and girls, it's time to get cracking. Alright you guys, so today we're going to be talking about NMR, but before we do that, let's talk a little bit about the background information, because why do we do these things? Why do we do things like IR? Why do we do NMR? Why do we do mass spec? Well these three things are just tests to help us see what type of compound we have, okay? So say we have an unknown compound from like Mars, okay? So we bring back a compound from Mars, we want to find out what it is. We put it through these three tests. We run an IR on it, an NMR, and a mass spec, okay? So we take the compound, we stick it in an IR machine, and the IR is going to tell us what type of functional groups are in that compound. So like if it has an amide, an ester, a carboxylic acid, whatever, okay? But it's not going to tell us anything about connectivity, how that compound is connected. And that's where NMR comes in. NMR is going to tell us how this compound is connected. And the last test we have is mass spec, okay? So we take our unknown compound, we stick it on a scale, which is a mass spec, and it's going to tell us, hey, your compound is 10 grams, okay? It's just like if I went on a scale, it would say, hey, you weigh 145 pounds, okay? So these three tests are just things that help us identify what a compound is. And this is really useful for if you have an unknown compound that you're trying to see what that compound is made of and how it's connected. And it's also useful for if you're trying to make something in lab, okay? So say you're trying to make a drug that's a specific compound. So you're gonna do all this work, do all these experiments to make a specific type of compound. And before you can sell it on the market, you have to make sure that you made exactly what you're claiming. So you put it through an IR, an NMR, a mass spec to make sure that it has the right functional groups, it's connected in the exact way you want, and it's the exact weight of the compound that you are expecting, okay? So that's why we do these things. IR to check for functional groups, NMR to check for how the compound is connected, and mass spec to see, hey, how much does this compound weigh, okay? So right now we'll concentrate on NMR. And I think that the best way to learn NMR is just by doing problems. A lot of people will try to teach the theory behind NMR, and it's good to know the theory, but it's a bit too complex to get anything meaningful out of it when you're trying to learn this the first time. Okay, so it's great to know the theory behind it, don't get me wrong, but really the investment that you put into mastering the theory doesn't get paid back with significant return, at least in the beginning, okay? So what I'm going to teach you is how we practically use NMR. When we run NMR, you aren't thinking about magnetic fields, electrons flipping around, or at least someone at our level isn't thinking that way. Okay, so you just want to be able to analyze the NMR to find out what compound you have and how it's connected. And you're going to follow the exact same steps every time we do this, okay? So like I said, I want to teach this with problems. And that's what these sheets are for. And you'll notice that I have four NMRs on each sheet. One sheet is a hydrogen NMR, the other is a carbon NMR. Can you tell me which sheet is the hydrogen NMR and which sheet is the carbon NMR? Well, is hydrogen NMR big or small numbers? Hydrogen NMR is the sheet with small numbers, okay, like 0, 1, 2, 3. Carbon NMR is the sheet with the big numbers, like 20, 40, 60, 80, okay? So, hey, let's look at the sheet with the small numbers first, the hydrogen NMR. Okay, so let's look at the one in the upper left-hand corner. And this is what you'll get on an NMR question. It'll be like problem one, NMR. Okay, so example one. You'll be given an NMR graph like this one in the upper left, and you'll also be given the formula for a compound. Okay, so for this first one, the formula is C3H7Br. So on an NMR problem, they're going to give you two pieces of information. The molecular formula, in this case C3H7Br, and the NMR, like we have on our sheet of paper. 
And from those two pieces of information, you're supposed to be able to tell what does this thing look like? How is this thing connected? Okay, so whenever you do an NMR problem, I want you to follow the same set of steps every time. And the first thing I want you to do is check for something called units of unsaturation. Okay, let's write this down. Number units of unsaturation. So what are units of unsaturation? Well, it has to do with hydrogens, okay? Let's see an example. Okay, so we've got CH4. Would you say that this compound is saturated or unsaturated? We would call this compound saturated. And what that means is, is that this carbon has all the hydrogens it can around it. This carbon can't have any more hydrogens attached to it. He's got one, two, three, four. He's already got four hydrogens around him. He's maxed out. He's completely saturated with hydrogens, okay? Let's look at another compound. Okay, so what about this compound, CH3, CH3? Is this compound saturated or unsaturated? He's saturated also, right? Because these carbons have all the hydrogens around them that's possible. This carbon has one, two, three hydrogens around him. He can't have a fourth one here because he's attached to a carbon. This carbon also has one, two, three, can't have a fourth one because he's attached to a carbon. Okay, so this compound has the max number of hydrogens attached for a two carbon compound. He is saturated. Let's look at another example. Okay, so we've got CH2, CH2. Would we say that this compound is saturated or unsaturated? This compound's unsaturated, right? Because check it out. If you took away one of these double bonds, there's room for two more hydrogens here, right? One hydrogen on this carbon and one hydrogen on this carbon. So how many units of unsaturation would you say this guy has? We'd say that this compound has one unit of unsaturation because it's missing two hydrogens. So the way we find out how many units of unsaturation there are is by either checking how many multiple bonds are present or how many hydrogens are missing. For every two missing hydrogens, that's considered one unit of unsaturation. If you'd rather look at this in terms of multiple bonds, then you'll see that for each multiple bond in a compound, that means that there are two missing hydrogens. So each multiple bond would count for one unit of unsaturation, okay? So hey, this guy had one multiple bond, so he has one unit of unsaturation. Or you can say, since there's two missing hydrogens, that's one unit of unsaturation. Let's look at one more example. Okay, so here we have a triple bond, an alkyne, CH, CH. And I told you that you can look at units of unsaturation in terms of either the number of missing hydrogens or the number of multiple bonds you have in a compound. Okay, so let's look at how many hydrogens are missing here first. And if we took away these multiple bonds here and here, there'd be room for two more hydrogens on this carbon. One, two and two more hydrogens on this carbon, giving us a total of four missing hydrogens in this compound. And if one unit of unsaturation is equal to two missing hydrogens, then we'd consider this compound to have two units of unsaturation. One unit of unsaturation for these two hydrogens, one unit of unsaturation for these two hydrogens, okay? Giving us two units of unsaturation in this compound. The other way to find units of unsaturations is just to look at how many multiple bonds you have, okay? So this originally was an alkyne, CH, CH. So as you can see, an alkyne, a triple bond, consists of one single bond that we see in black there and two multiple bonds, which I've drawn in blue. So for each multiple bond you have here and here, you have one unit of unsaturation. So in this case, we'd have one, 
two units of unsaturation, one for each multiple bond, okay? It's just two ways of saying the exact same thing. One multiple bond accounts for two missing hydrogens, which is just one unit of unsaturation, okay? So, hey, let's look at one final example. Okay, so here we have cyclohexane, a six carbon ring. How many units of unsaturation would you say that this compound has? Well, at first glance, you might think, hey, this compound has all single bonds, no multiple bonds, so it should have zero units of unsaturation. But look real closely, you guys, this is a six carbon ring. Let's draw out the straight chain form of a six carbon compound to compare. Okay, so do me a favor. Go ahead and draw in the hydrogens for each one of these carbons in the ring form and the straight chain form. Count up the hydrogens that we have in the ring form as well as the straight chain form and then we'll see how many units of unsaturation this ring has. Okay, so we've drawn out all the hydrogens on each carbon of the ring as well as on the straight chain compound. Okay, so let's count up these hydrogens and see how the straight chain form compares to the ring form. Okay, so here we've got six carbons in this ring, two hydrogens on each carbon. Okay, so six carbons in a ring, two hydrogens on each carbon. That'll give us a total of two, four, six, eight, ten, twelve hydrogens in this ring. Let's look at our straight chain form now. Here we've got three hydrogens on this carbon, plus two hydrogens on this carbon is five, plus two is seven, plus two is nine, plus two is 11, plus three is 14 hydrogens. And check it out, you guys. In the straight chain form, we've got 14 hydrogens versus only 12 hydrogens in the ring form. How did this happen? How did the ring form lose those two hydrogens? Why is it missing those two hydrogens? Well, if you close up a six carbon compound into a ring, you'll find out that you'll lose these two hydrogens in order to close it up into a ring. That's how this six carbon compound, this six carbon ring loses those two hydrogens. Okay, so how many units of unsaturation would you say a ring has if it's missing two hydrogens? If you're missing two hydrogens, that's one unit of unsaturation, okay? So a ring counts for one unit of unsaturation. So to summarize, you're gonna see units of unsaturation in terms of double bonds, triple bonds, and now we've seen it in rings. Whenever you see a compound with any one of those, you automatically know that there's gonna be units of unsaturation in that compound, okay? So, hey, let's just write up the formula for units of unsaturation so you have it in your notes. So this is our formula for finding the number units of unsaturation for any compound. And you can do it like we did before where you draw out the compound, look for the number of missing hydrogens. For every two missing hydrogens, that's equal to one unit of unsaturation. Or you can just follow this simple formula to calculate out units of unsaturation. So let me talk you through this real quick. Number units of unsaturation, this equals two times N. N is just the number of carbons in the compound. Okay, so two times the number of carbons plus two minus the number of hydrogens and divide that whole thing by two. And this is just a really fast, simple way of calculating out the number of units of unsaturation you have in a compound, okay? And hey, make a note over here in blue that if you have a halogen, okay, so X, that's a halogen, then for every halogen, you're going to subtract one, okay? So say, for example, you have three bromines in your compound. You'll do two times the number of carbons plus two minus the number of hydrogens minus the number of halogens. I said if you had three, then you're going to subtract three, divide this whole thing by two, okay? Likewise, if you have a nitrogen in your compound, you're going to plus one, okay? So say, for example, you have two nitrogens in your compound, then you'll do two N plus two minus H, and then plus the number of nitrogens, in this case I said two, so just do plus two and then divide the whole 